Yeah, welcome, and uh, yeah, you're so brave that so many of you are still here, and uh, we wish you good luck uh, <laughs> with this last topic, which is quite, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so yeah, from the labs, so um, I'm Christopher Lubeck, might know me, presenter doesn't, yes. Good idea. So yeah, I'm CEO of network team and technical lead, and I'm in the NEOS team since 2008. And did quite some stuff there, the fusion, caching, different parts of the content repository, dimensions, and uh, whatnot. So <laughs> touched almost everything. So, I'm Bernard. I joined the NEOS team last year in September. Um, I currently work as a software engineer at Core 4 in Hannover. And um, some, I thought it was a good idea as an initial assignment in this team to refactor the content repository. It seemed like an easy task. <laughs> so, um, I also um, uh, want to welcome you here. And um, yeah, let's begin. Yeah. So. So we are all pretty happy with NEOS, right? And um, it's a really powerful and cool system to work with. So the question is, what's really the power behind NEOS? So what's your idea? Is it the front-end rendering? Is it the user interface? So what, what makes it so powerful that I can work with content in a structured way and having it really easy to define new content and have features like dimensions and, and workspaces with fallbacks and everything. So in the end, it, what, what the power behind that is the content repository. That's the building block for NEOS. That's our foundation. So, but then do we live in like a content repository utopia? Is everything perfect and we are totally happy? So no, I, I think we have quite some issues left there. Um, so we really would like to have something like history support um, and uh, undo. Undo would be great, right? Having a, a button to say, no, I didn't want to edit that or move, move it here, do it, make it backwards. So not possible right now. It's really not possible at the technical level. And we really struggle to get the publishing of more complex changes right. So moving between the different parts and in dimensions with workspaces, that's really complex code. And uh, there are still some bugs inside there that you can find if you try hard. So um, it really took us a, a long time to get that stable, um, stable enough. And then we have some parts like querying with dimensions, um, which were introduced a little bit later after we published the initial content repository. And we now have workspaces with fallbacks, so you can have team workspaces and stuff which are pretty powerful. But all these features have quite some, some impact on querying data. So on each query in the system, you need to evaluate a lot of stuff and uh, need to find the right variant. What is the best matching node for my query? And that's not an easy problem. And in the end, the API grew a little bit out of hand because we never really did an API modeling. It just happened to be the way it is right now. So, and uh, it works, but it's, it could be more consistent and could be more powerful uh, API. So yeah, what, what's uh, the status quo? Um, the content repository, the API grew since version 1.0 to implement new features on top instead of having a consistent API that was modeled. Um, the current complexity blocks the progress. So having new features um, is uh, adding more features that we would like to have uh, for users is harder because of the complexity inside the code, which is littered uh, around a lot of different components. Then we have some performance issues in different parts on queries. If you have a lot of nodes on one level, you can hit performance issues. If you do, there are scenarios that work 
pretty well, and, and most of the times it, it, it's perfectly fine, but there's still some, some limits you can hit. You can find solutions around that, but uh, we want to do better. So yeah, what, what, are, our goal, what are our goals? Um, we want to solve these performance issues. We want to reduce complexity by modeling some aspects more explicit instead of putting it all around the code base and having a few consistency checks here and some stuff there. And so it's, it's quite hard to reason about this system today. And of course, we want to enable new great features, which perfectly aligns with the vision we have with the new UI, which will enable us again to, to go forward with great new features. So how do we do that? So you heard about it a few times this uh, conference. Again, it's uh, the CQRS and event sourcing uh, for some parts of the system that we think is the best answer to, to these problems and could uh, be a, a great solution. So how, do we, how did we proceed? There was a workshop with uh, Matthias, which you saw at this conference uh, last year in December in Frankfurt. And uh, a few from the NEOS team, including myself, and uh, Bernhard uh, did uh, attend this workshop, and yeah, it was like a crash course with event sourcing and getting up to the concepts and uh, getting hands on to the modeling event storming of a content repository, which is not such an easy task be because it's a pretty generic domain. It's uh, so uh, it's it's pretty hard to find the right events and everything because. In the end, you could be too generic about them. Like, huh, I create content, I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be more specific. And so, yeah, we, we started, and I, I just want to give you a little sneak peek of uh, how that could work from the concepts we, we um, did there or designed there. So editing with events, how could that work? So we have a content editable, and I type in a new word. I put my cursor and type in a new word. So the front end sends that to the server and says uh, the user edited something. So in the CQRS uh, architecture, there's this pattern of a command, and the command encapsulates an action. And the action is update node properties. And um, the command uh, has as a payload all the information we need. So in this... Uh, particular case, we have uh, the text property change, we have the old value and the new value, because it might be interesting to have both in the same command. And we have some identifiers to identify what has been edited, which variant, and which workspace, and technical details around that to identify the change. So then we have that command, and it goes to a Okay, that's my boy. <laughs> um, um, it goes to a so-called command handler, which uh, deals with commands. And um, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> We, we have to talk on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we have this command handler, and the command handler gets these commands and knows how to deal with that. And um, we might have this concept of an aggregate. I won't explain too much about it. An aggregate holds uh, some knowledge about uh, consistency uh, um, aspects of, of the model. So, um, in the end, there's some part in the system that knows which events should result from a command. So then we have this event store. I hope you all got some notion by now from, from Robert or from Matthias. So an event store is basically just a collection of things that happened. And uh, in our case, it's something about the content. And the thing is, you don't change things that happened. 
you can't change them. They just happened. It's immutable in that way, and it's just linear. It's another thing happened, and then another, and you have a consistent order of these events. So that's easy. We just have an event which is named in the present uh, case uh, node properties were updated. And again, we have this payload of the text property. So until, that, uh, until this, it's pretty easy and obvious. And we, we go, can go further. We can say, now we want to do some more events. We have our node properties were updated event, and then some document node was inserted into the tree event, and that might hold a position where it was inserted, which node type was inserted, maybe uh, other nodes that were auto-created, like content collections to hold uh, other nodes. So um, then maybe a node properties were updated event again to, to edit some, some content. And finally, maybe some workspace event. So what happens with workspaces? Um, if we have just one event stream and a workspace can easily be discarded, you can work on different workspaces in parallel and maybe only publish one workspace. And since events are basically a ledger of things which are the, the single source of truth of the system. Do we want to store things that might not have happened at all because a user did not publish the workspace? And do we want to store each and every single edit operation which could pile up to quite a large amount of events? So the um, question is, what do we do with workspaces? And yeah, you know, during the workshop, it was like, we went into alternate realities. We, we thought about, so what if we do not have only one event stream and we can use uh, a system ideally where we have the live event stream where we publish a node was updated event that was already published, for example, or imported or whatever. And then we have a workspace we then went a little bit further and said, yeah, workspaces are nice, but let's call it editing session because inside a workspace, there might be many editing sessions because you always work in the same workspace of your user, but then it's published and then you start a new editing session. So we got the notion of an editing session, which we don't have right now. We don't need it in the, the current model. So it's some aspect we learned about that we didn't model explicitly. So we have editing session one. And then you do the alternate reality, not alternate facts, it's alternate realities. <laughs> and um, you start having a, a, an event, E2, dash, um, that would happen if that workspace is, or editing session is published. And then something else could happen, could have happened in the live event stream. Um, the real E2. So events are sequenced in most event stores uh, for, for various reasons. So that's also a thing we had to, to keep in mind to, to not, not break. And then something else happens in that editing session um, uh, in the content. So, and now a second uh, workspace editing session starts and there's also some content down there. So that's how the, the system could look if multiple editors work in different editing sessions and work with the system. So. How do <laughs> but how do, how, how do we publish that? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, perfect. Um, so publishing. So we, we thought about how can we publish that? Um, because and we can't rewrite the event streams to, to merge that in between. And, you know, we work with the versioning system, which is quite popular, which has many great concepts, including immutable commits, which are like events. And we, it, it helped like having that at a, as a mental model. So we thought about, well, then let's do a rebase to finally publish that. So 
for all of you that don't know Git uh, too well, it's like um, you you take the the the, um, the current branch. So this editing session is basically a branch. So we we have a separate reality where we publish events. And if we decide that we want to apply these events, we have to bring it to the most current uh, event that is already published. So in this example, we have event E2, and we need to uh, rebase, so put our events of the editing session on top of that event. So here they are basically renumbered, or new event IDs are taken, so we don't rewrite anything, we just start a new editing session when rebasing, and now we have a perfect new feature we can uh, give the, the user. We can have a conflict detection and resolving UI, basically. So currently it's the last publish wins. So if you have a workspace and publish it, and if you have an older workspace with other changes lying around, and someone logs in into the system a few weeks later and says, oh, I've still unpublished changes, I'll just publish them. He could perfectly um, override, um, override changes you already published and wanted to make live. So that's pretty dangerous, and we can't detect that right now. Um, so we can have, with, with some work, um, a really cool conflict detection on top of that. Um, so, yeah. Basically, it's like Git for content with dimensions and workspaces. So, <laughs> easy mental model. Um, yeah, so how, how would that look with commands? Um, Matthias spoiled that a little bit. It's like command sourcing. He told us, yeah, but you, normally you don't do that. But in your case, it would be fine. So, <laughs> he knows more about that whole stuff from, from uh, many projects where he applied the, these patterns. So, it was really a great help. And in this case, the idea is to take these events that are not yet in, t in the live event stream, make a new command that says, I want to apply these events as new commands. And um, for example, the command is publish the commands of editing session three. These, the commands where no properties were updated or publish, that's not right. So it has to be an action, of course, from the text, but you get the idea. And um, so a bunch of commands that should be applied. And it goes to a command handler again, and maybe some thing that does some validation of if all conflicts are resolved or any structural issues might arise if you do that. And then it goes into the live event stream as perfectly ordered events. And nice thing is we can do some optimization, like if you know Git, there's this squash idea where you can have multiple edits and squash them into a single one to make it more uh, yeah, intuitive to see what the changes were, to have less single commits. And here we have all kinds of opportunities to like, if you only change single words all the time in text, we can compress that into one edit event for a single node. So have less events, which reduces storage and everything. So we can decide, we can have different strategies. Um, at least we have the opportunity from the model, so we have more information. Yeah, so that's our state from the concept phase, but is that really something which helps us in reading this stuff? We only talked about uh, writing events for editing and, and everything, so that doesn't help us really to solve the issues of querying data that is in different dimensions with fallback. So I would like to hand over to Bernhard, who has quite some ideas about that. So, uh, thank you. Um, so um, we've learned a lot about all those events and event sourcing and event storming and messages and uh, all this message uh, over, um, over structure thingy. So, um, uh, one could get uh, the idea that uh, we're actually done because uh, we all, all have this new structure and it's uh, the non-structure, the message structure, if you want to uh, call it that way. Um, 
But um, as Christopher just said, um, we have to have some content structure in a projection, for example, that can actually keep up with all this complexity. So uh, let's talk a bit about graph theory. Um, it's, uh, sadly, it's not the hangover session. It would be the perfect topic for that. <laughs> um, so at, at the beginning, let's look at the status quo. So we have our nodes in a node data repository, and they're stored there independently. You just can add new node data objects, and they work fine without um, knowing whether there are other ones or not. Um, you have uh, different defining data components, like an identifier for an identification of the node within its tree. A tree basically is what you can see in the Neos backend. You can select one of multiple trees via the dimension selector, and there is a different tree for the live workspace and your own. So a tree is basically a representation of all nodes within a combination of workspace and um, dimension values. So path and index define the position within a tree, and the workspace and dimensions um, in a node data record are for identification of the node's original tree. So the tree it was originally created in. There are some um, access restriction properties. And uh, last but not least, there's the node type and properties um, fields for semantics and content. So um, the issues about that. Um, the fallback determination is expensive. Um, uh, we already had that before. It's easy if you only have uh, one single dimension and just uh, follow along the paths and you're ready. But um, during, uh, due to our fallback mechanisms, um, maybe you have uh, multiple dimensions with multiple possible dimension values and fallbacks defined. So you actually have to recalculate which of those possible children, for example, are actual children in your current context. Um, and uh, yeah, this, um, um, this is because a node data record itself, it has an original tree it was created in, but it can actually belong to multiple trees. Um, yeah, they're only aware of uh, the tree that they were created in, not to the trees they belong to. And uh, fetching the right node data record is not trivial, as we will see in... Um, the near future. And all this fallback determination is done during read time, and that makes querying the content repository as slow as it is right now. It works fine uh, unless your project gets too large, but um, actually we don't, don't want uh, that the system, you can't, we don't want that situation where you can say, okay, use NEOS for up to 100,000 nodes and not a single one more because then it gets too slow, so we need another model for that. Um, another issue is that um, there are some node operations like moving a node with many child nodes um, to another place. It's uh, rather slow because all those paths in the node data records have to be updated, and it's error prone because um, all of these fallback me mechanisms. And um, one naive approach would actually be to solve this to just uh, duplicate the nodes all over the place. So, for example, you have a node and you have 45 dimensions, like we had in our project. Um, then just copy the node 45 times, and you know exactly who is, uh, who is parent, who are whose children. There's only one problem about that. It's, it's a mess regarding uh, duplicate data. You have to keep track of all those nodes and have to keep them in sync, and uh, you uh, usually don't want to do that. So um, let's have a look at uh, some graphical stuff that should help visualize this. So um, I've prepared a small example, which is rather simple. You have two dimensions, market and language. Uh, markets, uh, Germany and England, with Germany for having fallback to England and language German having a fallback to English. There are four possible trees in this, England-English, England-German, Germany-English, and Germany-German. 
So um, that's uh, the way the nodes are currently stored in the node data repository. There's some kind of system node sites, which is unstructured and doesn't have any configuration regarding um, the dimensions. Then we have three home pages um, uh, in, in three different variants. And um, there's no version for Germany German. And then we have two sub pages that are only uh, available in the default combination. So, what we, uh, so now the task is uh, find out which nodes uh, build, for example, the menu for the Germany German version of this website. So it's not easy. You have actually to decide which of those three home pages are the, uh, is the one that you actually want to use. In this example, it will be probably the Germany English one because we want to stay in the market because it's the primary dimension, but this has to be calculated on each request. So how do we get rid of that without duplicating all those nodes? So the idea is to separate structure from content and say, okay, uh, all the structural components, like uh, where is this node and what tree does it belong to or which trees does it belong to, um, need to move out of the node. And luckily for us in graphs, there are not only nodes, but there are also edges which we can use. So let's look at the same example, but in a graph. And that's what it looks like. So we have still the three homepage nodes, but there are edges for all, of, all available trees. For example, we have that, um, yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. So um, to know which homepage uh, we want to display, or if we are to display a homepage at all, we just follow the Germany German edges along the graph, and now we see which nodes actually belong to the tree we want to render. So, um, I need to start some process now because there's one, th um, one thing where we actually uh, use that model. It's used, um, I, I already teasered that uh, during um, the, the NEOS Awards. Um, this is, you know, most of you probably know this one and uh, it's, it's the node index build command and um, uh, for many people, it's, it's a, little, a little bit painful if you have a big project. These are 56,000 nodes in 45 dimensions, uh, dimension values and combinations. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's see if we can get this one finished before the talk is over. So what this actually does is it reads the node data records uh, into memory and puts, in it, uh, puts all those records into this set uh, graph structure where all, uh, each and every node is aware of uh, its position within the graph and then this in-memory graph will be projected into Elasticsearch. So this will take some time, I think about five to 10 minutes. And um, yeah, in the meantime, let's look at another thing. We have um, started a little side project um, while everyone else was um, busy writing the UI. <laughs> and uh, it's called um, the Content Repository Event Sourced. It's based on the event sourcing flow package. And um, we're uh, in the process of catching all those events that could probably happen within the system and um, uh, emit them and then project them into different projections. Um, I've prepared a little graph projection for this. And um, <coughs> yeah, this, this is uh, something, uh, in just another entry for the shame gallery, but um, it, it displays th something uh, quite, quite nicely. So I have this test mess command. So I created a mess um, yesterday by importing um, 30,000 uh, news nodes on the root level, and now I want uh, the content graph to retrieve the five latest news out of those 30,000 without um, an index. So how long can this take? Uh, this is actually a worst case flow query. 
So you can't do anything much worse than this. And um, it takes about yeah, a second to load all those nodes into memory, and then another one and a half seconds to sort them and to return the result. So this is really bad, don't do this at home. But um, the actual power of this is you, you, you have one single SQL query, you have all the nodes in their context in memory, and now you can do everything you want. You can, could write your own um, XML sitemap from this in like no time. And that's where we, where we want to go with this projection. So um, this, this is nice um, when you read, because you know everything that you want to know. Let's look at a few operations, uh, because this whole fallback complexity is not gone. It's still there, it's still um, not easy. So let's see what happens if we move a node. It's one of the most painful stuff we can currently do. Um, so we, we actually don't have to touch the node at all. I just have to move it to the right so you can still see what happens. So if you want to move that alongside the page node, um, then we just reconnect the edges to the new parents. So for the, um, for the violet one, it's a no-brainer. Just go to the violet parent. Um, same for blue. And the same for red. Now the interesting part is, again, which is the new parent of the yellow edge? This is exactly the same problem we have had before. And um, there's another concept, which is currently um, used implicit all over the code, and um, we've made it explicit. It's called the interdimensional fallback graph. <laughs> I love this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have all those four trees, and actually the fallback values are um, calculated between all those possible trees. So you have that um, England English one, which is the fallback for everyone. Um, there's England German, which uh, can only fall back to England English because you cannot fall back from England to Germany in the, um, in the dimension itself. And the other way around is for Germany English. And int the interesting part is actually Germany German because it has three possible fallbacks can do a fallback in, um, in the market, in the language, or in both. And we have to be able to calculate the weight for all those fallbacks, and that's actually possible. So, for example, the first fallback we want to, we want to do is uh, to Germany English, because we want to stay in the market. It's the most, um, yeah, it's, it's the, high, um, the highest prioritized um, dimension. So, we have zero in the first dimension, one in the, in the second. You can't do any smaller fallback, so that's our primary fallback. There's a secondary one where you can um, a fallback in the market and stay in the language, and the least desirable one is to do a fallback in both of those. There's a little formula in the implementation that can do this for all um, combination of uh, dimensions and dimension values and all kind of fallbacks. So this is now explicit and can be used for all projectors. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay, it has lost, okay. So what we do is separate uh, structure and content. We move structure inform information from node to hierarchy edge records. The path becomes obsolete. If you want the path, just traverse the tree up. You don't need it for anything else. Index and name, only where still needed, um, move to the edge. So um, since you don't have a path anymore, you don't need a name for the nodes. There are a few exceptions. For example, um, the, um, the child nodes, the content collections that have a path like main or stage or something like that, they still need that name and that goes to the hierarchical edge. Multiple edges can connect to nodes in, in different trees. We had that one. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we, we just simply hash the combination of workspace and dimensions. The, dimen the workspace is actually, in the graph model, the least um, relevant dimension and nothing else. And access restrictions are moved into a separate mechanism. We have a look at that. So in conclusion, the fallback determination is still expensive. It's essential complexity in our system because we want that complex fallback to happen. Um, edges supplement nodes and the information, which uh, trees they belong to, because you can't just tag, um, in, 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 for example, in a SQL database, you can't just tag a node data record with multiple entries and then query that. So let's put that into an edge. It's also the right model for that. Um, Fallback determination is, doing th through, uh, is done during write time, not during read time. And formerly um, scary operations like moving, they become quite trivial. So um, this uh, connecting to nodes with multiple edges seems to be redundant, but it actually enables two features. You can now actually delete a node in a dimension variant. If, uh, for example, you have a, an untranslated English node and you don't want to have it in the German fallback, that doesn't work. You can, you can delete it, then it's gone, but if you publish it, it's there again because the fallback mechanism is uh, at order now. So you can, uh, currently you have to create a variant, disable that, and that's actually not what we want to have. In the new model, you could just remove that one edge and so this node no longer belongs to that tree. Uh, we can also reorder nodes um, in different variants without creating new records. We just put another index to the connecting edge, which is already there. So, additional possible edge types. Um, don't be afraid, there won't be an edge types YAML. <laughs> this is a little bit too complex. So, ancestry edges uh, could replace the paths so that you still know which, um, which node has a connection to which other node in a parent-child relation. So each node has as many ancestor edges as it has parents up the tree. Um, that could make, um, for example, searching for node types within the, um, the tree much easier. It, but it's on, uh, it has a drawback because it um, adds the con complexity of move operations again because you have to um, realign a lot of edges, which is possible, but um, we have to be aware of that. Accessibility edges um, are a nice thing because currently to know whether um, a node is accessible from when to when and for whom, um, to know that you have actually have to traverse up the tree and evaluate um, all the parents because they might be disabled too, for example. And um, with edges, you can say who disables whom. And um, yeah, that's actually much, uh, much more nice. Reference edges could replace reference properties. Um, this is a nice thing because you can evaluate them in both directions. So you, just don't, you don't just know whom I'm referencing, but also by whom I'm referenced as a node. Uh, sibling edges, that's kind of an edge case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you, for example, if it's important to have your directly um, neighboring nodes, you just could, could do that chained list across siblings. And um, property edges, that's um, a slightly different model where you um, move all that fallback logic from node level to property level to have shared properties across dimension borders, for example. Later. But yes, <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah, late, later. It's, 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 yeah. So, where do we uh, project the graph? I mean, there's this standard SQL thing you have to do uh, every time because the standard stack um, um, comes with a SQL database. We had that um, messy example from before. It actually works kind of, not, not for everything, but um, yeah, should do the trick. SQL is actually not that bad at storing graphs because you have entities and relations, and yeah, that's, um, that's not ideal, but it's okay. 
Um, then, yeah, what I'd really, really like to do is put the content repository into the graph database because that's, that, that's its natural environment. That's where it belongs. We can do this um, Elasticsearch thingy. Oh, we could, we could uh, have a look at how far this has gotten. Um, with uh, all the edges and nested, document, as, uh, nested documents, we have a look at that index. And, or, or even to memory for high performance content repository instances. Like so. SAP does. <laughs> <laughs> then it's NEOS Enterprise Edition with in memory content repositories. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, the Elastic Search Index is done. We now have 55,000 nodes and 290,000 edges in our Elastic Search Index. It took about five minutes. Um, and um, actually, the amount of edges would have been the amount of nodes in the index before because it was multiplied into all um, possible variants. So we have a much smaller index now. It was ridiculously fast, actually. Um, and let's have a look at the index itself, what it looks like. So for example, um, this is was the previous build, early build one. So um, this is a product in this Elasticsearch index. It has a few properties, a few relations. Yeah, a few more relations. Just a few. <laughs> uh, other relations. A few more relations. <laughs> and uh, finally, it has exactly one edge. So this is kind of a merged edge, which knows everything <laughs> there is to know about the, the connections in this. So it knows the tree it belongs to. And it has a sorting index, it's uh, stored the access roles for this node, it knows whether the node is hidden from when to where, and um, you can actually now query the Elasticsearch index with a th exactly one uh, query and uh, don't, have, uh, don't ever like have wrong results. So, I hand this one back. Yeah, so I hope you got a small idea of what we are up to with the content repository. So we want to combine the efforts and I won't give you a detailed architecture uh, introduction. We don't have time for that. But um, so the idea would be the content graph that um, Bernhard talked about is, is one part of the system which could be an independent package like Matthias suggested, it would be a good idea to have that uh, separated. Then we have that new CKRS uh, event source architecture, which we, and that's our plan, can slowly um, introduce into the system by actually using it in the current system with, uh, by hooking into the current uh, implementation, then providing a st uh, completely uh, compatible node API adapter. So everything works uh, as current, even if you already have some custom content repository uh, uh, usages like importing stuff from somewhere and using this node API, it would stay stable. And then having a new API with new features um, separated and read requests would go to the content graph with much be better performance. So yeah. We're just starting with that, and I hope at the next NeosCon we can have a progress like we can, like we have now with the React UI, which all, all also was at that state a year and a half back. So, um, yeah, thank you for your patience with this pretty technical topic, and yeah, we hope you got an idea and wish you, uh, yeah. Happy conference. To <laughs> I. No.